Dr. Heather Keefe, thank you, my love, for joining me today. <laughs> We're both giggling because you're also one of my besties, you know, but I love saying Dr. Heather Keefe. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for asking me to be here. I'm so excited to be part of your podcast. I am beyond thrilled and honored and stoked that my listeners get a chance to hear from you. I already did a huge brag sesh on you in the intro of the podcast, but please tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from. Um, I want to hear more of your artistic side background as well as what led you into this career field. So spill. It's funny. I, uh, my mother tells this story often about how when I was a little girl, I was dancing constantly and I told her one day I wanted to be a dancing doctor. Um, and it turns out that's what I did. <laughs> so, so I, I have, uh, since I could move, um, been dancing and singing with all of my stuffies and, um, and, and somehow I, I'm just a very curious person. And so for me being in academia and kind of going through all the way to the end, uh, was a natural progression for me. I find humans really, really interesting. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> so they feel like divergent parts of myself sometimes, like my really scientific self and then my artistic self, but they do marry um, well together. I was thinking about a number of things when I knew I was coming to your podcast and we'll talk about it in, in a few moments, but um, I was thinking about kind of how those things have, have been present throughout my life and how they've knitted themselves through um, and creating of who I am and how I express myself. Um, but I am a licensed clinical psychologist, as you know, and um, I do teach, which I, I, um, I love teaching. I love being with people um, who are still learning the field and growing um, into the field as, as a, like a lifelong learner myself. And so it's a really um, exciting part of the work that I do, but also get to work really closely with, with people as they navigate really difficult aspects of their own journey. Um, and so I do spend um, a lot of time with veterans and people with polytrauma and LGBTQ persons and people of faith navigating all of the intersectionality of all of those things. Um, and I really do enjoy that, that work. Um, and I will say, I, I have had, um, just as like my artistic self, I probably danced most of my life um, and then came into theater and music um, and even, um, you know, painting and other types of artistic expression. It's part of how I'm functioning. I, I noticed for myself that I'm um, not as well, like as a well-rounded human, I don't feel as whole if I'm not expressing myself some way that way. So um, it's just helpful for me to kind of hold that space because I, I am very scientific and I'll live in the academic world for a long time, but I'll feel like part of me is missing if I don't also have artistic expressions. And this is why I'm such a fan. And <laughs> I know that you and I offline have, I've known Heather, Dr. Heather, for 12 plus years now. And she and I have sung together. We have danced together. We have performed together. We've collaborated together. This is why I think what you're going to share with us today is so valuable because that is how we roll here on the podcast. That is how I teach, how I coach, how I inspire, and how I create art myself is this integration of what's going on in my head, in my heart, in my body that helps me navigate and create and produce. And I've, I've witnessed over the years that, like you said, in those moments where you feel like there's an imbalance, it definitely affects the art. It affects my voice. I can't tell you the amount of clients I've had rush in here from something, maybe they were like really, you know, running late to their lesson time, whether it was online or in person. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's just sing. Let's just sing. Let's just sing. And it sucked for them. <laughs> you know? And they were so mad at themselves. So disappointed because it's, they, they, they try to compartmentalize and, and, and some forms we'll probably talk about this a little bit. Sometimes that's a survival mode thing, but we, I mean, you've experienced, I've experienced and have witnessed that when an artist learns the integration of the mental component of singing, just as much as they're working on the actual physiological vocal technique, it unlocks so much freedom, so much confidence for them because 
they learn body intuitiveness, right? They learn how to connect with their audiences. They're much more engaging, you know, to watch or to listen to or to enjoy in whatever medium, right? Because they feel like they're showing up as their truest self. And so thank you so much for sharing that. It's one of the millions of reasons I love you so much that I'm such a huge fan of your work. Same. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies. So one of the biggest things that performing artists in general, and specifically talking to singers on stage, is this idea of obviously navigating the nerves, the anxiety, little stage fright, you know, in varying degrees. And there's this sentiment of push, 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 get through, get through, get through, just like I mentioned before with, you know, the, the client that rushes in. But here's probably one of the biggest disappointments or things that I know personally breaks my heart for that I see. The singer is working so hard to get through, to push through the actual performance that afterwards it just feels like a complete blur. <laughs> they weren't actually able to enjoy themselves. And what happens is then they start building a performance career functioning that way and which leads down to burnout probably a lot quicker than they hope for right i mean nobody expects to feel burnout but i see this pattern happening and thankfully i'm part of a community of coaches teachers you know psychologists you know where we're seeing that it doesn't have to be this way <laughs> it doesn't have to be this way so talk us through why you think that is happening you know both in your you know, professional expertise, as well as just your personal experience. Why do you think that disconnect happens? You know, I love, I love this question from you, Mel, because I, I have personally experienced this on um, so many occasions, not only when I'm performing, but also even when I'm teaching. Right. And I love teaching. I was just talking about that. So during things that I love, I'm still finding this, like, um, it's not survival mode. It almost feels like perfectionism is showing up, right? And the striving, the striving toward perfectionism. And I've been putting a lot of thought into that recently. And I even took a couple of notes, actually, because I knew you and I would be talking. And I, I was thinking about this coming up. And I thought, what are the ways in which this shows up for me personally? And does this reflect itself into the literature, right, in our field? Because, again, my science brain is coming on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking about this, that, like, it's like, Almost for me, I'll speak personally, um, that my experience is kind of like this, um, almost like minor dissociation, like I separate from myself and I don't understand that. And so I spent some time thinking about that and it's this feeling of like, oh no, I am very aware of the fact that people are looking at me, that I need to have the right answers. That I need to hit the right notes. I need to remember all the words, right? Like all those things start showing up for me. And I noticed that I was like, okay, well, here's, here's some places in which that's happening. Are there ways in which that's not happening? Is there, is there something different in my life? Is it, is there a place in which that doesn't show up? And I find that when I'm dancing, it actually doesn't show up. I'm very much in my body. I'm very kind of in tune to the music and doing what I'm doing. And I'm less aware of an audience during that time. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, no wonder I close my eyes almost every time I sing now. So the last few times, like I, I really have to like I disengage from the fact that there's an audience, um, especially if I'm doing worship, right? Then it's just me and God and me and God can hang out. And I know that he is totally cool with my imperfect. <laughs> right? Like he accepts all of me. So I don't have to be something else in front of God. I can just be who I am. And, but with other humans, I'm worried about some of the judgment I think is what's coming up for me or that concern about being perfect um, and, or not being perfect and having the judgment come in. So um, I find that when I'm, I'm kind of in that headspace is when I start to kind of pull away from myself. It's a, it's a, like a protective measure for my mind, just trying to protect me. Um, and sometimes that shows up when I'm teaching, right? Like I'm, I get so kind of flustered or caught up in something. Maybe I had a, a difficult client, not a difficult client, but a difficult kind of session or something that happened right before uh, coming into a classroom. And I may still be in that headspace as opposed to being fully where I am in the class and kind of forget where I am on my slides or forget you know, a, a term or something, and that can kind of throw me off. And so I found that when those things show up, uh, I struggle a little bit more with being present. And that's really for me. Um, and even when I was looking in the literature, like the ability to be present and in the moment is a really helpful tool. Have you experienced that? No, absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh, 
for me, um, now that I like I've, I've learned so much about myself, just even in my own therapy journey in the last two and a half years and everything. And for me, the way like my anxiety presents itself is this surge of adrenaline. So it, it's not that I've uh, I haven't really grappled with like stage fright unless like for whatever reason, I felt it was a high stakes performance or something like that, where it was like, whoa. But you will find me before a performance situation, like you said, be it actually performing arts or speaking in constant motion, <laughs> push ups, jumping jacks, dance, duh, you know, duh. in addition to my breath work, because I the body, it's a somatic experience for me, I, I need to release it. So yes, then what happens if I haven't given myself that moment? It's like this overactive brain thing going on and it, it's it, it's a hamster wheel that doesn't stop. And then what happens is there was so much of my mental, so much mental output happening. I look back and unless I saw a video someone took of me singing, it's like I don't remember the details of the singing. And so, yeah, I've I've been trying to do that work of presence here probably in the last year and definitely helping my clients through that as well my singing clients so it's just uh, yeah how do we do that dr dr heather <laughs> so how do we stay present <laughs> it's funny that you say that because i until you just said that i forgot that i would i would routinely if my mother was um present for some something that i was doing uh, whether it be a, a talk that i was giving or a performance i would come off stage and literally be like did i did i do anything weird like did, what i like i have no memory i fully like i will have no idea what i said i'll you know um so so to like so it's it's so common right and i know all the tricks i know mindfulness i understand how this works and it still happens for me and so it's a practice mm -hmm. um i just use the 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 phrase um the terminology mindfulness and i do really mean that there is a practice of mindfulness it's a practice of being present with oneself i um there are experts in mindfulness been doing it for decades and decades and decades psychologists and otherwise um, and they will talk about how being present with yourself is one of the most difficult things that we as humans can do right to be present with yourself without distraction mm -hmm. without you know some something else happening to to pull us away from ourselves um is so rare in our human experience especially nowadays and we have you know like these things everywhere yeah. um it's it's just so it's so present i just held up a phone for the people who are on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> um, so like it, it's a really um it's a really unique opportunity to to grow um and when i talk with clients about this specifically and this is part of my own practice mm -hmm. when i talk with clients about mindfulness um I do it in a way of talking about it like a like a muscle memory, right? And so um, clients will talk to me about, you know, they'll think mindfulness is meditation. They're actually two different things. And we can geek out on that if you really want to, but they're two different things. Mindfulness is fully being present in the moment right now, very aware of all your sensory experiences. And sometimes that means like just being quiet and attuning, right? Um, sometimes when I'm working with clients, I will walk them through their five senses. What are the things you see, hear, smell? Can you feel anything on your skin? And um, sometimes I will do a mindfulness exercise, especially with my polytrauma people that we're working through, kind of getting in touch with the body sensory. Um, like I will have them walk through kind of an eating exercise where we like, what does it feel like to have, you know, this candy bar? What does it taste like? What are the sensations that you have feeling with your esophagus into your stomach? Like we go through the whole gamut, just really getting people in touch with their bodies um, and in touch with their um, senses. And it's a whole um, practice that takes a long time. So hear me when I say practice, I don't mean it's that you achieve it one day. It is a, it is a pretty, uh, lifelong practice of being continuously aware. And oftentimes when I'm working with people who've never sat with themselves before, it is one of the most painful experiences. And they're like, I can only do it for like a second. And I, and like, I cheer that I'm so excited. I'm like, yeah, you did it for a second. That's amazing. Because every time people turn toward themselves, every time people make that turn toward 
their awareness of themselves or awareness of the present moment. That is the practice, right? Like that is the thing. It's not this achieved moment where we're like fully in Zen and having like this out of body experience. No, it's, it's the act of turning towards yourself. It's the act of turning toward the present moment. That is the, the win. It is the mindfulness experience. It is the practice. And so I want people, if they hear nothing else from my mouth in this moment, that they hear like, the act of just pulling yourself into the present moment is, is the win and is the thing that I want people to celebrate for themselves. Amen. Oh my goodness. I'm like, yes, 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 yes. I love, I, I love how, um, you made this more like bite size for us, right? To digest going with the food analogies here, you know, continuously aware how it is a, it is a practice and the practice of presence, absolutely. So um, I'm curious, what does the literature say? Like, so here are your personal experiences. Here's what you're walking, you know, your clients through, you know, what does the research say about this? I mean, I, I mean, I personally have read a little bit of it, but for the listener, you know, what is happening in this field to, in addition to what you've probably already shared with some of the tools that you walk your clients through, what is actually happening in our brains? when we experience dissociation, when we feel like that blur? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, dissociation is, well, let me just break this down to film. So dissociation is when the mind kind of separates you from kind of the outside world. And there's a couple of ways in which that happens. Um, it can pull you out of your body. So some people experience themselves existing outside of their body, actually. And some people pull into like, um, it's almost like going into a back room of their mind, if that makes sense. So they're, there's, they're in, in the world, but kind of in a back corner where nobody can kind of see them and they're kind of um, tied off and quiet. And the mind is doing that to protect itself. The mind is never looking to harm you. The mind is always looking um, for survival, it's always looking for protection. Um, the mind also doesn't always choose health. And so I want people to hear that the mind will choose um, patterns, like really well-worn patterns to get to a place of protection or to get to a place of safety or what feels like safety in the moment. And so sometimes we'll see people doing maladaptive things, like things that aren't super healthy for them, but at least let them to feel kind of protected in the moment or safe in the moment. And so a lot of the work that I do um, with people in therapy is to help them find new patterns that lead toward wellness, right? It's like, if you think about kind of water following water, like water as it drips down, a window will follow other kind of droplets of water, but sometimes that's not the fastest or best way to get to where they need to go, right? So we'll kind of create these new, um, healthier patterns, patterns that take them toward healing um, so that they can unlearn and um, kind of get rid of the old patterns that weren't really helping them, but we're creating safety. So we're gonna walk people through a healing process to a place of better safety, more wholeness. And so dissociation isn't, isn't like the mind punishing itself or the mind doing something bad. It's really just trying to protect you. And so what I find, um, and the literature bears this out, right? So one of the ways that we really help people who are constantly kind of like leaving themselves, uh, and I don't mean this in a pathological way, I just mean like people who kind of have, have to pull away from the present moment, mm -hmm. is to really draw them back to the present moment. And I, I find with people that, you know, it's a really scary, scary thing. Um, and it's because it feels super, super big because they've been pulling away for so long that to be present seems almost impossible. And so part of the work that I do is to be present <laughs> with people who are being present, right? And to, to help them bear witness. I, I often, um, I use the analogy of a trail guide when I talk with people about my role in therapy. And I'm not there to force them from point A to point B. I'm not there to to be an expert in their life. They are the expert in their life, right? I'm an expert in the field. And I've walked with people along this trail a whole bunch of times. And I can point out for them like, oh, wait, here's, here's, a, here's a place where people often stumble. Oh, here's a place where it's really steep. You wanna walk around the other side, right? So I walk along this path with people, um, honoring their own unique journey in that, but allowing them to kind of step toward 
um, awareness of themselves to gain insight in that way and to really allow this to unfold in a way that's really natural for them while I'm prompting them um, with the best tools and skills that I have. Does that answer your question? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like gold, gold, gold. I mean, yes, yes. Because I love that you said they're the expert of their life and you're the expert in the field and this is a conversation that's been happening a lot with voice in the voice teaching community we're hearing things from our singing clients like this is just like therapy and there's and i, I think it's that connection of the opening up the vulnerability the encouragement to let go of yourself a little bit i have one singing client who says this year I committed to doing things that scare the hell out of me. So I'm taking voice lessons, you know, <laughs> and, and she has just risen to the occasion. So these are people who are aware, right? They have a specific goal in mind, they, you know, whatever. And it, I love what you say about allowing, allowing space, giving people space to be able to do that. And I hope for the listener, I hope people feel comforted in that it isn't this, you know, steps one through three, boom, you're there, you know, that it is a process. And I, I think it's also to a cultural thing. I mean, probably worldwide, but specifically here in the United States, we're used to instantaneous results. That's what sells. <laughs> but in our, you know, performance path, it really is a lifelong journey, like you said. So I, I love everything that you said about that and so how would you let's say that, that you did have you know a performing artist a performing vocalist in your chair you know who's who let's assume that you know they probably had some very discouraging or even traumatic performance events for them because i know that a lot of the singers i work with these were traumas that they experienced that were done in a very public matter uh, manner because it was on stage it was in front of an audience you know how would you walk them through or get them started on this path of being present uh, there's a number of things I would do, but I always start with assessment, right? And, and I don't mean that like big assessment, like you fill out questionnaires and stuff. I mean that more like, help me understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I mean that in the, like, we're going to slow way down. I want to know everything that pops into your mind. I want to know every experience that you have in your physical body. I want to know um, how they relate to one another, what emotions are coming up at the same time. So we break all that way down and I ask a lot of questions about, you know, what happens next? Um, currently, but also the history, right? So if there is this kind of like moment for them, if there was this really, really difficult um, series of feedbacks or even just like a, a performance or an event that happened, uh, what was happening during that time? What did those things mean to you? What, what did they say to you? How did they connect to other moments in your life? Have you gotten similar feedback? Um, how does this knit together? Because the person is a whole person. They're not just a performer, right? So like the whole person, what, it, what is it that's being told to them? I do a lot of work um, within narrative therapy. Uh, people often hear about like cognitive behavioral therapy and other types of things. And those are wonderful um, tools. I work a lot with narrative therapy, specifically when I'm trying to understand um, the messages that people have received and the ones in which they've um, kind of brought into themselves and it's like, there's a dominant narrative that shows up, the one that's been told to them and that they also kind of take ownership inside of themselves. And so I, I break that down, like what stories have been told about you? What parts of that are useful? What parts of that do you believe? Can we reject parts of that? Can we rewrite parts of that narrative? Can we make this um, uh, uh, like a, a, a story, right? Can we make your life more, um, can we make the life narrative more, helpful and healing and healthful right for you um because there are lots of things that that are, we are told especially at a young age at those like formative ages adolescence is one of those times when um just like zero to five a lot's happening in the brain adolescence that like 10 to 13 so much is restructuring happens in the brain and so much formative stuff happens during that time and so if they're having these difficult experiences especially in that adolescence age it can again get stuck in the brain right and these narratives get told about you by people in power your parents your coaches mm -hmm. your whoever and and that they get they get like stuck into the fabric of who we are and how do we 
undo those things in a way that allows you to create new meaning, new narratives, better stories about who you are. Um, and this is partly why I love doing integrated work because God tells a way better story about us. <laughs> God tells them a significantly better story. And so, and even pe for people who are not of a faith, right? There are other ways to make a meaningful life experience um, and meaningful narrative come out. So that's just one way in which, but there are obviously other ways, but I do a lot of work to really slow people down to understand what exactly is going on. What are they reacting to? And what, what meaning have they created um, inside of themselves for these experiences? Mm -hmm. I love it. Slow down, <laughs> slow down. I think we can all definitely cling to that advice. Um, Heather, is there anything else that you just want to leave our listeners with, especially the listener who's still grappling and pushing through these performance anxieties and longs so much to, you know, finally start singing and showing up authentically and with freedom? Honestly, what comes to mind is I really, what I hope people um, walk away with, what I hope every person gets to walk away with is that you get to, to live this life. And I don't mean that in like a, like a, like a pithy kind of way. Like, I mean, like you actually get to live. And so part of this is how do you want to do that? Do you want to do that in a way in which you enjoy the things that you do, right? Like the client that you have, like, I'm going to do something scary because I want to live without fear. I want to try things and break myself of the stuff that's been holding me back. I hope that people um, get to choose a life of joy, get to choose a life of, um, like wholeness with themselves, right? That, that there's so much judgment from the outside. Um, and there are absolutely things that you can have like a desire to want to better yourself. I think those are wonderful aspirations, but it's another thing to be critical of the fact that we are imperfect. I think our imperfections are so human um, and, you, and it's fine to want to address those and, and to create new healthy patterns. I am a thousand percent for that. But don't let it hold you back from the present joy, right? Don't let it hold you back from the present acknowledgement of who you are and where you are and living that out in a way that feels really authentic. I love it. I love it. I love it. Amen to that. Thank you so much for being with me today and for sharing this time. Um, this is definitely one, if you're listening to this and you were on a walk or jog, you might want to go back and sit down and jot some notes. <laughs> it's so good. So good. Dr. Heather Keefe, my friend and my colleague as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love you so much. Good to see you.